Hello and welcome to Access Chat. We're delighted to be joined today by Ace Ratcliffe. Ace is a person that I have been following for quite some time now on social media. Hardest person in the world to schedule for Access Chat. Um, <laughs> not because she's a diva, um, but it's actually <laughs> great to have you here. Um, so, I, you know, as I said, I've been um, seeing your articles for a long time. You, you're, you're on Twitter as Mortuary Report. I was just really you know intrigued by some of the stuff you were posting way back when um, and now you're spending a lot of time uh, writing about disability inclusion rights and, and so on and taking the stuff that you're doing into non-disability focused media which I think is really interesting and important but can you tell us a little bit about more about how you came to be working in the space and a bit about your story yeah, absolutely. So, um, as Neil said, I'm a Fulton Ratcliffe, and uh, I am hard to schedule. <laughs> um, that's more about uh, the surgeries I always end up having unexpectedly than being a diva, I promise. <laughs> um, so, as mentioned, my, my name on Twitter is Mortuary Report, and that is because I was actually a mortician for six years, and at the end of my career as a mortician, I was... Uh, diagnosed with a degenerative collagen disorder called hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And I had been hunting for a reason for my chronic pain for, um, gosh, since I was about 18. So I got diagnosed at 26. And then, of course, once I got the diagnosis, realized that there was a lifetime of symptoms that had begun when I was essentially in utero. Um, and through the sort of process of my disease, I have really been led into disability spaces and disability activism. I'm a part-time wheelchair user, and so that is what I talk about now because it affects so much of my life. I'm 32, so somehow it's been, what is that, five years, six years? I'm terrible at math, so um, that's where I am. I no longer am a mortician. I do still work in death care, but disability justice and activism is just a huge part of my life. Yeah, I, I, I think I I came across um, some of the stuff you were posting because you you were posting stuff on the hospital glam hashtag, um, which I absolutely love. Um, so how did you come across hospital glam? Was it something that you were aware of and someone pointed it out to you, or did you just sort of? bounce into it like I did and, and, and fall in love with the stuff that was being posted and the concept behind it, which I think is awesome. That's a great question. I honestly cannot, I feel like hospital glam has just always been a part of my life at this point. Um, I've been friends online with hospital glam's creator, Carolyn, for ages now. And Carolyn is always posting about hospital glam. And I had actually started doing a series of self-portraits while I was in the mortuary. And so sort of porting that over to doing that while I was in doctor's offices was just a really natural thing for me to do and to attach such an incredible idea of, you know, hospital glam, the idea of taking control in a place where I think patients so often feel like they have very little control. Um, it's, such, it's such a powerful thing. I, I couldn't resist. No, and, and and yeah, I remember the mortuary photos, um, and, and 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 yeah, you're right. The 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 change of setting and the juxtaposition between yeah you know, the the beautifully set photos and the the well posed and thought out composition of the photos and how people are feeling, the enablement of people being able to reclaim the space and reclaim dignity. I think is is yeah. such a really great idea, great concept, and and also high art at the same time. It is high art, and I think it carries into uh, you know the way that you end up. Sorry about that. I don't know if you can hear my dog in the background. Okay. Bash, come here. <laughs> Forgive me. He's uncontrollable. Um, I think that one of the things that ends up happening is. So sorry, Bash. Come here. <laughs> Come here. You can't control animals. 
No, you really, really cannot. I'm so sorry about that. Even when you're married to a vet. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we all remote. Baby here. Yeah. So we are all we all we are all remote, and you know, uh, you no. Know, sometimes we have chickens, you know, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely can't control chickens. <laughs> um, Back to what you were saying, I just think that one of the things that's really great about it is when you create, you know, this, this piece of high art that you feel incredible when you're looking back through it, I think it carries even into the way that you end up interacting with doctors because you do feel so much more powerful and so much more in control. And it's a lot easier to say, uh, no, actually, you're not listening to me or I, you're not believing me or that's not actually how I want the treatment to go. And I, that's huge. So, I mean, I've uh, seen also that you've you've done a, a, a number of professional photo shoots as well, um, and, and done them um, both in and out of your wheelchair. What was the the motivation behind that, um, behind those photo shoots? Yeah. So I am. Being a photographer, I end up working with photographers, and so sometimes people will reach out to me and ask me to model, and mm -hmm. my, my number one caveat is that the wheelchair is always included, because I think, as so many of us are aware, that there's such a dearth of media imagery of actual wheelchair users in the actual wheelchairs, you know, so frequently we see somebody cripping up, or we see somebody in a wheelchair that clearly is not their wheelchair, um, or, you know, you see the just the awful stock photos where it's like the wheelchair on the beach or the wheelchair in a field of wheatgrass. <laughs> and it's yeah, like, yeah. what is this garbage? Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, so that, that's my number one insistence when I work with a photographer is that the wheelchair has to be included. And also, as a part-time wheelchair user, I think that really challenges a lot of people's perceptions of wheelchair users because... You know, when I'm out and about, if I'm at the grocery store and I stand up to grab something off of the shelf, you know, if there are people around me, it sort of blows their mind because that's just not something they see frequently in media. And so I feel like, you know, it's a little bit, not responsibility, because that sounds like kind of a negative word, but I do feel like I, I have a, a calling, I guess, to make sure that there are decent and, you know, and sometimes sexy, sometimes just normal, sometimes just natural representations of a part-time wheelchair user, because I think we need it. Yeah, no, I, I think that's, uh, you know, it is really important. I fully behind what you're trying to do. And believe me, I struggle to find good stock photos. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, <laughs> and, and, and also, you know, good stock photos representing hidden disabilities is really hard. And and EDS is uh, Ehlers Danlos syndrome is is a for the most part hidden disability. Uh, and I think it's mm -hmm. one that people aren't aren't really very f familiar with. Um, I I know it affects a lot of people. And once you once you start being aware of EDS, you find out there's loads of other people out there with EDS and there's like online communities and everything else, but most of the world's completely oblivious. So, I mean, can you tell us a little bit about more about EDS? Because not everyone that, that's watching will, will know about it. Absolutely. So, um, in sort of the EDS community, we say that it's not necessarily rare, but it's rarely diagnosed. Um, so the best way to describe it is that EDS is a type of collagen disorder, which means that the body makes collagen incorrectly at a genetic level. Um, there can be spontaneous instances of the disease, but more typically it is a hereditary disease. So it is actually every member of my family, uh, besides my father has it, um, and so collagen, so many people think that it's just in your skin, but it's actually the building block of your body and the mortar that holds those blocks together. And so when that collagen is built incorrectly, it can send so many different systems in your body haywire. Um, and the symptoms and the way that it affects is completely different for every patient. Um, and there are different types 
of hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos that affects different systems or different types of Ehlers-Danlos. Hypermobile is a, a one branch of it. So there, there are types that specifically affect the skeleton. There are types that specifically affect the heart. Um, hypermobility works on the spectrum. So some people can just be hypermobile where, you know, they're a little bit bendy and maybe they end up being a ballerina or there's somebody who, you know, does wild party tricks where they bend their fingers backwards. Um, and then at the far end of the spectrum, if you actually have HEDS heads, um, you know, you can deal with, as I have joint dislocation that's random and unexpected, you can deal with, you know, major issues like endometriosis or major issues um, with, you know, your skeletal system. So I've had, I think, a major surgery every year since 2013 as a result of the heads. So. Um, it's pretty nefarious because from what we can tell, it primarily affects people who are assigned female at first. Um, I would wonder if that is an actual thing or if it's just that we're not doing very much research. And, uh, you know, as we know that um, femme's pain is not taken as seriously. And so I think that the, the road to diagnosis can often be very difficult, which is why we don't know very much about it, you know. Antonio, did you have a question? So, uh, my my wife um, uh, was diagnosed with chronic pain a, a few years ago, and one of the things that she was struggling with at the beginning was to find a, a doctor that could actually understand her and basically understand, do a proper diagnosis. And, and it took her some time in, in order to in order to be able to get that correctly. So, uh, in relation to your experience with, with uh, do you feel that you had a, a similar experience in terms of your diagnostic and other people out there that can be listening to us might experience something similar? And uh, w what's your uh, you know, uh, view on that? I am so not surprised that your wife had a hard time finding a, a, a functional pain doctor. I think um, among all of the specialists, pain doctors are it's really hard to find a good pain doctor. Um, I think that, especially here in the United States with everything that's been going on with pain medication and opioids and access to medication, um, there's very much this thought that you should just kind of grin and bear it. Um, I can't speak for your wife's experience, but I know that through my process of trying to figure out what was going on with me you know i was told that i was a hypochondriac i was told that i was overreacting i was told that i had conversion disorder i was told that i was just too emotional um and so i think that my my recommendation for anyone who is going through the process of trying to find a good pain doctor is just trust yourself because you know your body better than any doctor is ever going to and you know if something is wrong. And I think we get so caught up in this idea that doctors are infallible and you should question them and that they know everything, but they're just humans. And so ultimately at the end of the day, you kind of have to be the person who directs your care and you have to be the person who says, no, that doesn't work for me or no, that's inaccurate or no, I can't continue with you because you obviously don't believe me. I've gotten very good at those. <laughs> I would bet your wife probably has too. <laughs> yeah. We had uh, a lady called Kate Nicholson on Access Chat a couple of times. Now, Kate's uh, a senior lawyer, but she's also a, a an advocate for for pain relief and um, mm -hmm. and 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 also for you know for appropriate prescription of opioid pain relief where necessary. So um, I, I think the the hysteria that, that you see around the opioid crisis um, is particularly strong in, in, in the US. We don't at the moment in, in, in Europe have the same kind of um, press about use of opioid painkillers, although unfortunately what's happened in the US is starting to Across the Atlantic, so there is 
more of an issue when in fact actually most of the people that are dying from the opioid crisis are people that are not taking or, or that are not being prescribed the opioids they may be taking prescription opioids but they're not the people that you know uh, uh, you know pain pain patients that have a prescription um mm -hmm. and i would recommend connecting with kate because she's she's superb uh go on Anthony. I, I i was just going to add that that's you know doctors sometimes they are very dismissive in relation to women yeah, uh, I remember really well. We both went to a doctor on a, you know, a Saturday morning, and uh, we were. You know, I I was with the flu. She was uh, uh, with a similar symptom, but was, she was really down. I was you no know, okay. I'm with the flu, but I was was able to go to work and you know, fine. And in the end, I got a list of pre prescription, and she got almost nothing. So I went to the pharmacy. I, I, I'm not going to buy all this. It's complete nonsense. Mm -hmm. I had just two items to order, and we start to realize that I was giving stronger drugs than she was. And she had when she I, we were both there, and she was describing her, her pain, how she was feeling, and in the end, we end up with a very odd uh, outcome that we realize well. No, we need to do something different here. We cannot just follow what this person just told us. Yeah, and I mean, I wish that that were not the the standard in most cases. But you know, when you look at the statistics, um, femmes are more likely to get sedatives than they are to get pain relief because, of course, we are hysterical um, in an emergency setting in particular. Uh, and if I remember correctly, the delay for femmes getting pain medication is 15 to 20 minutes compared to when men will usually get pain me medication in uh, an emergency room setting. Uh, it's just, it's, it's really frustrating. You know, my fiance and I were actually at the eye doctor just yesterday and, you know, I've seen this eye doctor probably three times at this point now. And this was the first time that my fiance had been there and, you know, he's sitting behind me and this eye doctor is, you know, a man, and he ended up speaking to my fiance through the entire appointment. And it was just like, I'm, what, 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 what? I'm the one here. I'm the patient. This is infuriating. <laughs> oh. uh, no, it's, it, it, it's, it's terribly frustrating. And we, we, we're, we're always seeing this kind of gender balance in, in, in lots of things that, that we see. It, it affects medicine, it affects employment. Uh, part of my, my day job is also working on other diversity topics. So 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 mm -hmm. we, we see an awful lot of bias, both uh, against gender and, and, and also disability as well. So um, you know, very, very concerned that, that you know, in, in this age where we are moving to uh, algorithms deciding stuff, that the innate biases in our society and the data that we've built up over years of bias and this history of women being written out of uh, history um, yep. is going to perpetuate and amplify that in the future. So that, that for me Absolutely. is really concerning. Yeah. I, it's a huge issue. I, I'm talking about it all the time. Um, my dad and I particularly like to talk about sort of future tech and AI. And, you know, it makes me think of not just bias when it comes to gender, but I mean, you start looking at people who are living with multiple marginalized identities, you know, a woman who is also a woman of color, you know, the, the, the bias that is so inherent there is just Oh, you know, I, I I don't know how many people are familiar, but they did this study just a couple of years ago where they were asking, it was new doctors, I think that they were going into their residencies, but they had completed medical school. And so they were asking them about people of color and their perception of pain. And these people who all have medical degrees were literally saying that they honestly believed that people of color had uh, higher pain thresholds than white people, which is obviously 
completely bunk and untrue, but, you know, that's the bias that our doctors are carrying into, you know, the medicine that they treat, which is why, you know, when we say that EDS, they think that it affects primarily white femmes, I, I would say that probably the reality is we actually haven't done an accurate amount of studying in, you know, outside of white populations. If we've got doctors who think that people of color don't experience pain the same way we do. Yeah, that's a that's a huge issue, um, and 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 I think that uh, hopefully you know there's a, a a generational shift because I I do think that working in in the space that I'm I'm working in we see generation Y and generation Z are much more open and equitable and you know gender fluidity and gender awareness and all of this kind of stuff is much more prominent and 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 and, and coming to the fore so I think that over time so long as we don't delegate all of our decisions to to robots some of this might solve itself but 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 first we've got to solve the solve the, the bias in, in our history and, and, and understand that and have diverse people um, and intersectional diversity, not just the, the, the silos of diversity, because we have this too, you know, the world is diverse, yeah. but yeah. We, we're, we're not necessarily inclusive and we're not necessarily connecting all of this stuff. You, you, you can be a, a, a woman of colour who is disabled, who is, you know, also uh, from a religious minority, and all of these things intersect. You know, there is there is no monoculture. We have multiple identities. There's multiple layers. It's like an onion. You just keep peeling them. Um, and, and Absolutely. I think yeah. That when we're doing all of these studies, we tend to focus on one thing, and we don't look at the the totality of it all. So I, I mean, I've I've seen yeah. you putting out stuff about intersectionality. I think it's it's a really important topic i mean who who would you also say are, are people leading in the space around uh, thinking of talking about intersectionality oh. now? well i mean i think that there are so many um there is the Harriet tubman collective which is incredible um alice wong and um i think i'm actually wearing a dis disability search shirt right now um alice wong is incredible um I'm so terrible with names at 10 o'clock in the morning. So those are the two that pop into my head immediately. Um, but, you yeah. know, the community is there and, and there's, you know, the hashtags, there's uh, disability to white there. I mean, there's just, there's yeah. so much incredible conversation going on out there that anybody who is, is not experiencing it is choosing to ignore it because it, it's happening. Definitely, I'm well aware of, of, of Alice and Valissa um, and, and, and their work, but um, but yeah, you're right. It's it's something that Antonia is also passionate about. It's actually English language, because um, uh, you know, English is not Antonia's first language, and there is stuff going on outside of the English-speaking world. But, yeah. True, true, and I uh, no, especially you know, there's a, an area that you know, we, uh, on especially on accessible tourism, uh, Spain is doing amazing work over the last 20 years. They have they organize, I don't know how many conferences and, and events between May and September, and and uh, if you if you go to uh, Airbnb or if you if you go to the main platforms where you are, you are able to uh, book online and you choose Spain, and then if there's a and assess a filter we're able to choose if the venue or the place is accessible if you choose, if you do it in spain and you do a search you get a massive number of results and then if you go to uk ireland or any other country in europe that list just drops down quite easily so it's a very interesting exercise to do is to go to the main platforms where you you have restaurant ratings and all that the most popular ones do a search and then do it by country to see how embedded uh the culture of the importance of accessibility is, you know, is how embedded that is into business. Absolutely, that's a fascinating thought, and Spain just rocketed up my to to visit list <laughs> based on this conversation. Um, I think Airbnb has done some really cool things with the way that mm -hmm. they let you 
sort of search for accessibility. And, and I mean, there are so many more options there than there are in so many other places. And um, yeah, travel is huge. Did, did you see, so um, in the United States here, the Department of Transportation has finally, after way too much uh, BS and blustering, um, we've started actually keeping record of how many scooters and wheelchairs are damaged by airlines. And so they just released the very first bit of that, um, the, the counting. And so in, yeah. it was like I think it was December 4th to December, yeah. And it was 701 wheelchairs and scooters damaged. And that was without two of the major airlines even actually doing uh, mm -hmm. an appropriate onboarding count. So you know that the number was, must have been even higher than that. So travel is a huge issue about accessibility, and I, I'm so glad that you're thinking about it too. And I'm so glad because I really want to travel internationally, and I'm always terrified to do so because of my wheelchair. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I know it's, I know it's an issue. We've, um, we've had um, a number of people on, um, talking about accessible travel. Um, it's something that's very close to home as well because my, my, my dad is a sometimes wheelchair user again so searching for accessible hotels and you know ones that say they're accessible aren't necessarily fully accessible and, and <laughs> yep. bathrooms and stuff like this so um yeah and sometimes you know the accessible loo is you know a, con a convenient storage area so, <laughs> other stuff. so um yep. all of these things are, are important um but yeah, the wheelchair and airlines thing is massive because people want to travel. People spend money. It's a it's a huge opportunity for the travel business. People with disabilities, are, uh, you know, are economically viable human beings. We're part of society. Um, we we have money. We spend money, um, and yet the the whole way that people are treated when it comes to air travel is just so backward. No, no, no and, sure. and there's kind of a, all organizations are known sometimes for a kind of obsession with customer experience, and they completely forgot uh, uh, that accessibility also is also should also be part of the customer experience. They invest so much money, and sometimes they complain that they are not able to get any return or ROI in, in customer experience, but you know at the same time they ignore massive opportunities in this space. Mm -hmm. I was just, I wrote a piece for uh, eater.com about uh, accessibility in restaurants and I found that it must have been, it was more than 10 years old, the study that was talking about the economic viability of disabled mm -hmm. people and how much money we have to spend and our spending power even 10 years ago was actually stronger than, you know, uh, the Hispanic population but nobody caters to us. I mean, we make up 20% of the population. It's, it's a huge missed opportunity for businesses. And, you know, I grew up, my dad is actually a pilot uh, for American Airlines. And so I've done a lot of traveling in my lifetime. And I got to say that traveling as a wheelchair user versus traveling as somebody who is non-disabled, I mean, they're completely different experiences, uh, 100%. And I am far less likely to travel by plane at this point. I, I end up dreading it. It's just everything about it is so hard and depressing and overwhelming. And, you know, and I'm a person who can get up and walk out of my wheelchair. So yeah. I don't even have to use an aisle chair. No, uh, and, and I, I, I was aware that they'd released the figures, but I'd seen something from Rebecca Coakley, who, you know, is mm -hmm. some, uh, another- Oh, Rebecca Coakley is also awesome. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, um, but this is something that's live and it's all, all around the world. Uh, it, it got a lot of attention in the UK um, because there is a, a, a journalist um, who from the BBC, Frank Gardner, who uh, is a wheelchair user and, and is the security correspondent for the BBC. And um, yeah, he, he 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 took to Twitter in a big way about his wheelchair being, um, you know, and the way he was treated. And um, 
I think that that brought some attention to it from a, from an airline management point of view because this is you know someone that that has a big broadcaster you know behind them, um, but it shouldn't take someone being you know it, it shouldn't be oh, a famous person is is you know being treated badly for the management to to sit up and take notice. And the other thing is, yeah. you know, you don't you know the other thing is the expectation that. You have a disability, therefore you're going to have a wheelchair. So I got pe people, friends of mine, uh, who are blind that really don't need a wheelchair. But every time they go to the airport, they're stuck in a wheelchair and <laughs> they lose their their yeah. agency by just being pushed along and sort of like treated like a piece of luggage. It's infuriating, and and, and I mean it's it's such a systemic problem because you know I think it because we're not just excluded from air travel, you know, we're excluded from access in schools, we're excluded from, you know, just basic travel around our cities. You know, you look at the MTA, you look at um, the tube, um, the, the stats on the, the accessibility for the London tube are not fabulous. Um, you look at accessibility in schools, you look at accessibility for the internet, you know, we're, we're forcibly excluded excluded from every aspect of life that you could possibly think of. And because of this, we, first off, aren't thought of, and second off, aren't able to be at those, those upper echelons where, you know, we have the ability and the voice to say, hey, we need to be thinking about accessibility from square one instead of, you know, throwing it in as an, oh, God, we forgot about this by the time the project is already done. And it's really, I mean, it's such a self-perpetuating problem um, you know we're not there because we're excluded and so we, we there's no voices who are fighting to make sure that we're included it's infuriating so I, I'm we another person that we featured that is helping get those voices to the top table is a lady called Caroline Casey um, and she started this thing called Valuable, and, and that got to Davos, and we're busy signing up the CEOs of you know, top companies to make the commitment to put it, disability on the board agenda and to start taking action awesome. and walk back on it. Um, because it's amazing what a CEO making a public commitment does to the mindset of middle management. <laughs> yep, ain't that the truth? <laughs> So yeah, it's like when they've done that, you know, it's like right, uh, we can't avoid this now. So yeah, but, but, <laughs> we can't hide anymore. Yeah, yeah, because the, the the you can you can bet your bottom dollar that the uh, once the CEO has signed up to something public like that, they're not wanting to be embarrassed on it. So 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 uh, that that's a positive thing. So, so you know, get out there, check out the the valuable five hundred, check out Caroline because she's you know, a, a lucid advocate for, for this stuff, very passionate. Um, because I think, you know, the more we all talk, talk about this stuff, the, the, the more we can raise that kind of level of awareness and so on. Um, we've only got a couple of minutes left. Um, there was one thing that I was also um, from cyber stalking you fascinated about, you talk about tattoos and the fact that you've got a bunch of tattoos and that you actually use them uh, partly to help with pain management. I do, I do, I absolutely do. Uh, so yes, I, I have lots of tattoos. I've, um, I, I, there's a whole. I talked about this in their whole article. There's a whole bunch of science behind the the, the gate theory and, and how it ends up working. But essentially, when you're dealing with sort of chronic, unrelenting pain that never ever stops. Um, when you give your brain another kind of pain to focus on, it sort of distracts your brain to focus on that pain instead of focusing on what your regular chronic pain is. Um, and so getting tattooed for me is a, a really good distraction from the normal everyday pain. Um, but it also, you know, because you're sort of actively injuring yourself, you get a whole blood of endorphins and neurotransmitters that make you feel real good and relaxed in my case i usually end up kind of falling asleep when i get tattooed um and you know i have a, a body that i i don't have a whole lot of control over uh, i don't get a whole lot of say I, I 
call my body my meat cage because I feel very separated from it. And so the act of being able to control it and sort of decorate it and, you know, make it feel like my own is really powerful and, and makes me feel much more like myself when I really sometimes don't. Great answer. Thank you very much for taking the time to talk with us today. It's been great, a long time coming, um, as we said. Um, so <laughs> thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to uh, kicking up a storm on Twitter on Tuesday. I think we're going to have a lot of fun. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for toughing it out to schedule me. <laughs> thank you. And, and thank you also to our friends at uh, Barclays and MyClearText for supporting us because they allow us to caption and, and, and uh, to keep uh, access chat going and make it more accessible. Thank you.